Now, very quickly, you're gonna realize that Blomundvoss was Germany's psych ward of aircraft developers. One of the many psychotic designs that Blomundvoss had during the war was for an asymmetrical ground attacker and dive bomber, which was designed in 1943 by Richard Vogt, designer of the Blomundvoss 177, as a replacement for the Stuka after the failure of the Junkers 187 program. Now, the reason for this aircraft's bizarre design was to provide a superior pilot view than conventional aircraft, as well as being far easier to construct and maintain. The fuselage of the aircraft was of an incredibly simple construction, with a single BMW 801D, 14-cylinder, double radial engine, which provided power to the adjustable three-bladed wooden propeller. Fuel would be provided to the engine from a 238-gallon tank, with additional fuel being available from a 264-gallon drop pod. The armor-plated cockpit was to be placed right of the fuselage, leaving the pilot sitting pretty off-center. Visibility for diving and landing was provided by a window in the nose of the cockpit. Armament consists of two forward-firing 15mm MG-151s, with two rear-facing 13mm MG-131 machine guns, with the potential of installing three 30mm MK-103 gun pods under the wings. The normal bomb load of this aircraft was to be around 1,102 pounds worth of bombs. However, an overload of another 1,102 pounds of bombs was possible. Proposals for the BV-237 consisted of the single-seat BV-237 dive bomber, the two-seater ground attacker, and the final variant being the BV-237B1, which used the first proposal's overall design with the addition of a Junkers Yumo 004B mounted beneath the wing in between the fuselage and cockpit. These proposals were shown to Hitler in early 1943, who immediately ordered the aircraft be put in production. However, the orders were ultimately not carried out. During the summer, Allied bombers conducted several raids on the city of Hamburg, which is the home of Blomundvoss's facilities. However, no damage was sustained. In spite of this, the Ministry of Aviation ordered all further development of the aircraft cease. Despite orders from the Ministry of Aviation, work continued at Blomundvoss, and it was determined the aircraft could be in production as early as mid-1945. However, these plans were abandoned near the end of 1944, with only a single wooden mock-up ever being delivered. The next horror show we have from Blomundvoss is the BVP-163. This incredibly unorthodox heavy attack bomber was designed by, yet again, Richard Vogt in 1942 as a potential replacement for the Heinkel HE-111 and Junkers Ju-88. Now, unlike pretty much every other aircraft of its time, this particular plane was to be built from welded sheet steel in order to reduce the usage of strategically valuable alloys which were already becoming scarce. The fuselage of the aircraft was to be unmanned, with most being made of steel, while the tail section and control surfaces were to be made of fabric-covered wood. The bomb load was to be carried primarily under the fuselage in a special indent. The bomb load of the aircraft was to be somewhere around 4,400 pounds of bombs, with larger bombs being carried in the indent in the fuselage, while smaller bombs were carried under the wings. By far the most unusual feature of this aircraft was the cockpit and primary defensive armament was mounted on the wingtips and large nacelles made of armored steel. Armament for this aircraft was projected to be six 20mm MG-151 cannons, and the reason for them being out the wingtips was to supposedly provide the maximum field of fire for the aircraft as well as giving the pilot the best possible visibility. In order to compensate for this unusual arrangement, the outboard weight was distributed through improved span loading of the wing, which supposedly reduced bending at the wing roots by potentially 44%, as well as permitting a lighter overall structure. Two propulsion systems were envisioned, one being two Daimler-Benz DB603 inverted V12 engines mounted in a side-by-side -side configuration for the O1 variant, and two BMW 803 28-cylinder radial engines mounted back-to-back -back for the O2 variant. 
Both variants sent power to a single contra-rotating propeller at the front of the fuselage. It is safe to assume that this aircraft would have required an incredible cooling system for both arrangements, as similar aircraft like the Heinkel 177 Greif were particularly infamous for the amount of overheating and fires they suffered. Before further research can be conducted, it was decided to modify a Blomundvass BV-141 by fitting a second cockpit on the wingtip, which lacked flight controls. Pilots found that the layout was definitely workable, however, further research proved that ultimately this aircraft arrangement warranted no further development, and the project was abandoned with only a single test rig and several schematics being completed. Now the next aircraft that we have on our list is an aircraft that I like to refer to as the Dorito of Death. That aircraft being the Lippisch P-13A, which was a further continuation of the work by Dr. Alexander Lippisch, which used a lot of knowledge that came from the P-12 program that preceded the P-13. Design work on this particular aircraft was carried out in late 1944, and it was decided that the aircraft was to feature incredibly sharp swept-back wings, angled at 60 degrees and connected to a large single tail fin, which housed both the cockpit and rudder, as well as a hollow central portion to allow for the installation of a solid-fuel ramjet engine. During the design phase of the wings, it was decided to make the outer portions of the wings foldable in order to allow for transportation by rail. Takeoff would have been aided by a special three-wheeled carriage which would jettison after takeoff, while landing would be handled by a double-hinged, articulated skid. In order to further aid in takeoff, it was proposed that a liquid-fueled rocket motor be installed in order to get the aircraft up to the ramjet operating speed. It is currently unknown, though, what type of rocket motor this would have been. Now, due to the extreme fuel shortages that Germany was suffering at this time, it was determined that the P-13A would be powered using powdered coal. According to Dr. Lippisch, he believed that the coal ramjet might actually be more effective than conventional liquid-fueled engines of the time, as the location of combustion was much more precisely controlled with the ramjet. The initial proposal for this ramjet engine called for a wire mesh basket holding equal-sized pieces of brown coal, which should be located in the lower region of the internal airflow. This arrangement caused the coal to emit carbon monoxide which mixed and combusted with the upper airflow downstream. However, this ultimately proved highly inefficient. As a result, the design was ultimately changed to a new vertical circular spinning basket which would spin at 60 RPM. The superheated exhaust would then be mixed with cooler bypass air to create greater thermodynamic efficiency which would then be expelled out through the rear nozzle. During this time, other fuels were considered by Dr. Lippisch as he believed that they had the potential of generating more flammable vapors, such as bituminous coal, as well as oil or paraffin heat-soaked pine wood. A scale model of this aircraft successfully passed testing at Spitzerberg Airfield in 1944, and now the project was deemed ready for a full-scale aerodynamic test. The test aircraft was to consist of a glider named the DM-1, which differed only from the production aircraft in having the ramjet opening omitted. Construction of the glider was slow as Dr. Lippisch had lost most of his interest in the design by this point, and merely continued work on the project to prevent students from the Darmstadt and Munich universities from being drafted. The glider would ultimately never be finished during wartime, and would later be captured by the Americans in 1945, who ordered the glider be completed, and then had it shipped back to the United States for testing. In fact, testing supposedly proved the design had outstanding stability, even at a speed of Mach 2.6. Post-war testing of the DM-1 would ultimately provide valuable information in the future development of various Delta Wing aircraft, such as the Dassault Mirage and the Saab 35 Draken. And somehow, it continues to go downhill from here. The next aircraft that we have is the Messerschmitt P-1109, or at least that is what it is believed to be, seeing as the original documentation is heavily damaged. This particular aircraft was designed in 1944 based off the work by 
<laughs> guess who? Dr. Richard Vogt with his BVP202 from July 15th, 1944. However, this particular aircraft was notably different in the fact that it sported two variable sweep wings mounted on the top and bottom of the fuselage, which was believed to provide better low-speed flight characteristics than conventional aircraft. This particular aircraft was to be powered by two Heinkel HES-011 turbojets, which were to be mounted in nacelles on each side of the fuselage. A tricycle landing gear arrangement was planned, but no schematics reveal where the wheels were to be stowed. Very little was actually known about this project. It seems that this aircraft may have possibly been further developed upon in post-war France, according to several surviving sketches. However, it is uncertain if this was actually the work of Messerschmitt or another firm. So the next aircraft we have on our list is one that is particularly odd, which is the Focke-Wulf VTOL project, which according to some sources is named the Rachen. This particular aircraft was designed by Heinrich Focke close to the end of the Second World War. Development of this aircraft can be traced all the way back to 1939, when Heinrich Focke patented the idea of a circular aircraft with a large airfoil section with an open center which acted as a giant air duct for the large twin contra-rotating propellers, which would be powered by an unnamed focke wolf turbojet, which would send power via an axle and gearbox. In order to achieve forward flight, air from the propellers was forced down through a series of louvers which angled toward the rear of the aircraft to generate thrust. These same louvers could be closed completely in the event of an engine failure, which would enable the aircraft to glide safely back to the ground. The exhaust nozzle at the end of the turbojet forked into two auxiliary combustion chambers, which were mounted at the rear of the airfoil which would act as a rather primitive form of an afterburner. These auxiliary chambers would also help provide control at low speeds through varying the power output through nozzles at the ends of the chambers. The landing gear was to consist of two simple main gear legs on either side of the propeller duct as well as a small tail wheel. A single fin and rudder would provide a lateral stability at high speed, with the pilot sitting in a nacelle protruding from the front of the airfoil. Following the war, a one-tenth scale model of the Rachen was built and wind tunnel tested in Bremen, and in 1957 Heinrich Focke filed to patent the aircraft, but ultimately this went nowhere and no examples of this plane were ever created. So the next aircraft that we have on our list honestly wouldn't look out of place in Thunderbirds, that being the Heinkel Lerche. Work began on the project on February 25th, 1945, and was finished on March 8th, 1945. A lot of the research that went into this project came from a previous project called the Heinkel Vespa, which ultimately went nowhere. This aircraft was a very early form of a coleopter, as it would take off and land sitting on its tail, flying horizontally like a conventional aircraft. The pilot was to lay prone in the nose of the aircraft directly above two contra-rotating propellers which were powered by two Daimler-Benz DB605D V12 engines. Control was to be provided through a nine-sided annular wing which acted as a giant air duct for the propellers. Armament was projected to consist of two 30mm MK108 cannons, with additional armament believed to be the Röstahl X4 missile. Despite the project being very innovative for its time, it ultimately also went nowhere, with only schematics being completed before the war's end. It should be noted that various parts of the aircraft's design are unknown, such as how the pilot would be able to see the ground when attempting to land, as well as the method which would allow the pilot to safely bail out without being sucked into the propellers. It's safe to say if you were to do an iceberg video about cursed German aircraft, these two aircraft would definitely be part of the abyss. The first one that we have here was a project by Daimler-Benz, which was for a fighter aircraft designed exclusively around the Daimler-Benz DB609 engine. The DB609 began development in September 1942 and was to be an inline 16-cylinder fuel-injected V16 engine which was to initially develop 2,700 horsepower, 
However, later it was increased to 3,400 horsepower and could even fit a four-stage supercharger. Now, the thing that makes this aircraft so cursed is the fact that the engine is in the fuselage nose, which is typical. However, the twin contra-rotating propellers are mounted directly behind the cockpit. The projected armament for this aircraft could either be the 30mm MK-103, 108, or the much rarer MK-212 cannon. The expected delivery date for the engine was predicted to be April 1947 in order to completely finish development and get the engine into production. Upon hearing this, the German Air Ministry was not pleased and immediately cancelled development of the DB609 engine in May 1943, which ultimately led to the death of not only the engine, but also the aircraft that was projected to carry it, with ultimately a handful of drawings being completed. Much like the Lercha, there are many elements of this aircraft that are not well understood, such as any possible way the pilot would be able to bail out without being pulled into the propellers, as well as how power would be delivered from the engine to the propellers without having a prop shaft going through the cockpit. Now, the final SCP that we have on our list is the Fokkewolf Treibflugel. This particular aircraft was a highly unconventional vertical takeoff and landing fighter and bomber interceptor designed in September 1944 in response to the need for fighter aircraft that did not require full-size airfields. Lift was to be provided by three untapered wings rotating around the fuselage which were to act as a giant propeller, which would be powered by Pabst ramjets mounted on the wingtips. It is worth noting that the ramjets would not be able to function at low speed, so the aircraft would either require a takeoff booster of some kind, or smaller Walter rocket engines could have been attached to each ramjet pod. Unlike the Lercha, the pilot was actually to sit upright. This particular cockpit arrangement would have made it incredibly difficult for the aircraft to land, as the pilot was to pitch the aircraft upward until vertical, and then slowly descend until the landing gear rested on the ground, Keep in mind that the pilot did not have an unimpaired line of sight with the ground, as he would have to either turn his head around and attempt to look behind him, or he would have to look through a mirror which would have a distorted view due to the spinning of the enormous propeller. Armament for this aircraft was proposed to consist of two 30mm MK-103 cannons as well as two 20mm MG-151 cannons. Ultimately, the Treibflugel only ever reached wind tunnel testing where it was tested up to Mach 0.9, however the results of this testing appear to have been lost to time. Much like the Lercha and the Jaeger, this aircraft also does not have any mention of how the pilot was to bail out safely, and frankly it would probably be far worse to try and bail out in the Treibflugel than it would be in the Lercha or the Jaeger, because the Treibflugel has propellers the size of a city bus, which are spinning at 220 revolutions per minute! Give me the dub, dub, dub.